Uh, but let me show it to you here and we'll break it down because this is what's unique about it. The guarantee uh, contract stuff is all stuff that teams are just blatantly upset about because they don't want to deal with them. They don't want to have to do a similar thing. Oh, I have to reshare my screen here. Sorry about that. Hang on a second. And teams can be frustrated for a number of reasons. They just don't want to pay money. I mean, that's honestly what it ends up being is they don't want to have to spend the money on it. And okay, I, I can understand that, I guess. Pop this in here. So this is what Patrick's uh, contract looks like. Let me see if I can maximize that window. And I want to get to the point where you see how everything here until it's nice and low in the base salaries. That's this first column. And you're cruising along two and a half, two and a half, two and a half. Yes, he's at five and a half. This is part of the function of recapturing and restructuring that's gone on here. But you see that these numbers are just gigantic. And that's how they're recouping cap space by converting these to salary, paying them out. Uh, and you get to the point here where like the dead cap right now would be 134 million. It's crazy, right? They did this on purpose. They did this. Uh, it, it creates itself a little bit of a piggy bank that they can go back to time and time again and continue to draw from. But you'll see here, the structure of it, even back when it was signed, really hits the wall in 2027, where the base salary hits 10 million and the roster bonus hits 50 million, putting him on the hook for what is you know a steady 40, 46, 48, 44. Now all of a sudden it jumps to 62. I believe because of the structure of this where you can, and maybe that's not even big enough, sorry folks, let me zoom that in a little bit. So this is total cap dollars. And in 2027, it goes to 62 million plus, uh, you know, obviously a little bit of change the way that that goes. This is truly what I think was always designed to be the restructure year or the extension year. I do think 2027 was where it needed to be. Now, do they rush that? I don't know. All these, these big dollar contracts that we knew they were going to come, so did the, the team, so did Patrick. But does that make them move it up? Um, could they jump and say do it uh, in 2026 after the 2025 season? It's possible. Um, honestly, the rate that the man is making money, I don't know that he's not going to be in Tom Brady's kind of uh, mentality here very soon where, okay, I, I'm making all this endorsement money. Like I'm, I'm set for life. My children are set for life. Maybe I can take it easy on the team and continue to make sure that we always have talent around me and on defense and at wide out and the whole nine yards. I do think that they they meant to do it in 2027. The question is going to be, do they accelerate that schedule at all? Right now, my money still says no. I could be wrong, but that's just the way that I feel. So we'll have to keep an eye out for it. And we could get some indications, especially if we start hearing things um, from his representation. I don't expect that, but... That's kind of the way that it would come down if it does. Uh, let's see. What Chiefs player will have a breakout year? And that's a great question. Let me get over to the depth chart as it stands today. At least this is, this is again, an estimation. This is not any kind of confirmed anything. But breaking out is tough to do when you have two new tackles here, you can see. Now you have second-year player and a third-year player as your X receivers, Z receivers, somewhere over there, uh, the X-factor receivers. I'm not trying to say that they're going to line up at X. Apologies, that's not what I meant. Uh, that will be MVS and Justin Watson mostly. Um, although Rasheed Rice can go in there, and I do feel that they feel like he's got the body type that he can do X, Y, and X, Z, and slot, uh, cover them all. Um, Richie James, I'm a little bit less optimistic on that. I do think he's going to be like a Z slot only kind of player. But I do think there's upside in Richie's, uh, Richie James's game, and that might be, along with Rasheed Rice, where Andy starts to concentrate. But the guy that I think is – they keep calling Kadarius Tony a number one. In their minds, they want him to be a number one, much like they wanted Tyreek back in the day. And so we saw what happened with the progression of Tyreek. When they decided he, was, he had gotten the skill sets down and, and that he could do what they needed him to do, they were able to force feed him and turn him into the player uh, of the caliber that they, they thought he could be. And that does take some concentrated uh, attention, but certainly within the realm of possibility. And I think that may be what we were looking at in Kadarius Tony. But I will also say that Sky Moore has, I think, the ability to make the biggest leap in terms of, of overall production and, and and worth to the offense. Um, he's been a guy that 
just got off on the wrong start with the special teams thing, started to really come on. And I think what you saw in the Super Bowl with both of them running the same kind of routes and being successful, I think they show you that they're going to be able to do some duo things. They're going to be able to do some things that uh, get the hands, get the ball into the hands of Sky more a little bit earlier. Uh, whereas you can do a little bit more downfield with Tony is, is my approximation. But I do think both of them have the ability to break out. The question is going to be, what does the rookie do? Um, Rasheed Rice, normally a, a rookie isn't somebody that I would project to have uh, a glaring impact right away, but he certainly is somebody that could. So I like that, and I, I hope that we see that as well.